So I thought I would sh uh, start by giving you a little, really, really little demo of, a, of GIF, just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that you need to throw into a programming language to actually make this approach work. So this is Hello World, written in, in GIF. So you'll notice that it looks a lot like Java, intentionally. And then there are a few differences. So the uh, signature of the main function in Java, that would just take in an array of strings. And here you'll see that uh, the array of strings has this, this open, close brace after it. And what that's telling us is that uh, what, what the security uh, annotation, the security label on the args parameter is. In this case, we're, it's, they're being treated as public inputs to the, to the program. And then there's this other argument, pp, which I have managed to make in syntactically incorrect. OK, there we go. So, so pp is a principle. What's a principle, you wonder? Well, this, that's a, that's a GIF-ism. So GIF has a notion not only of labels that annotate information and say how secure and how confidential it needs to be, but it also has a notion of principles. And principles are first-class values that we, you can pass around, but you can also use them to express policies. So for example, right here, what, what we're saying, ugh, right here, what we're saying is that the security level of the security label of PP is actually the integrity of PP. So the left arrow in, in GIF terminology means it's an integrity policy. So what we're saying is you should what this says is you should trust this input as much as you trust PP itself. So you'll notice that this is actually a kind of simple dependent type because we're talking about a runtime value in the in the type itself. And it's actually recursive as well. Like PP is talking about itself. So that, that, and that's all OK. Um, and then what the code does is it, it gets a runtime object, which is the way that you interact with the outside world and which will do some access control, some, to some dynamic security enforcement. And if it's not allowed to generate, if you're not allowed to get a runtime for PP itself, so that's a, so PP here is a, is a kind of type level parameter uh, to runtime, but uh, this language has reified type level parameters, so the, the code can actually inspect it and can do runtime tests on it, and determines whether you can get a runtime object for this particular principle, and if so, then you can use that runtime uh, to get out things like a, an output stream, and then you can print things to the to hello world. Okay, so if I try to com compile this, it doesn't compile. And the problem is that it's complaining about the possibility that the method might communicate information by raising an exception. So, so we talked about the program counters before and how we have to track control flow. Well, in a language like Java, which has exceptions, you have to track information flow through the exceptions themselves. The fact that an exception was raised might communicate information. And so in this case, the problem is that the language can't prove that you're not getting uh, learning something you shouldn't from the fact that a null pointer exception was raised. So we can solve that problem by giving up on null pointer exceptions and uh, by compiling it with an explicit flag that says, if you get an unhandled exception, oh, okay, that should have worked, I thought. Did I save it? Okay, see the dark angel of demos has struck again. Uh, okay, maybe I was supposed to have that there. Let me just see, I don't think that that should help. Hmm. Okay, well you can see it's very persnickety. And this is the problem with programming in GIF. It's frustrating because you type, write something you think is gonna be correct and, and the thing rejects it. And, uh, and why, why is this not working though? I had this working yesterday. <laughs> Sorry? If you arrow up, you might be able to see what command you Yeah, it's, no, I tried that already. Um, so if, so let's see, I can, I can do an explain, but I think the problem here is, no, no, this is not an information flow violation. This is a failure to catch an exception. Why? Or 
No, it should have it should have just treated as an uncaught. Uh, the problem here is that it doesn't know that runtime is not null. And if runtime is null, then it um, it's going to raise an exception. Okay. I, well, all right. I, I could try to debug this. I don't. I, I know I had this working with exactly this command. So naturally, naturally, it has to break. I just recompiled the whole system. That was probably my mistake. <laughs> They never do a fresh build. <laughs> uh, hmm. Okay. Well. All right. So anyway, you get the, you get the flavor of it, um, including the, the frustrating errors. Uh, so the so the the nice thing about it is that when it actually compiles, then you have actually dealt with all of these information flows, including things through uh, through exception pathways that you probably never would have thought of when you were trying to think about the code, and uh, and I think. There's kind of two thoughts about how you should do checking of software for security. One is that people are going to write software, and then other people should come along and be security analysts and figure out what security policies the software satisfies, and they'll just ch and they'll just verify that the software is okay. Uh, and I think that that is uh, a pipe dream, because the software will not actually satisfy the security policies, and so. So the, the, the real problem here is that when you go to build a piece of software, when you go to Im implement a piece of software, as a programmer, you need guidance about whether the code you're writing is secure or not. And absent some help from tools or programming uh, you know, type, type checkers, you're not going to get it right. You're, you, the, so, the, so I think it's actually important to have types integrated into the software construction process. Yep. Yeah, we have to. It's kind of a. It, this is kind of a fictitious leak, and uh, and and it would. You know, my mistake here is trying to show you a program that actually does something as opposed to a little artificial piece of code. So we'd have to look at the runtime class to see what the signature of of Git runtime is. And I think that it has some. There's some label on the uh, on, on the result of Git runtime that claims that it might be leaking some information. And I'm, I'm really not sure what's going on. I'll, I'll, hopefully, I'll, I'll get this debugged and I'll show you again tomorrow and it'll, it'll work this time. Uh, here, I'll show you one more since, let, let me show you a more interesting example. I'm not even going to try to get this one running. Uh, but this is a uh, Battleship implementation. So you guys have played the, the game Battleship, right? So Battleship has a bunch of different code in it. Uh, and this definitely worked at one time. Um, so it, so it has boards. A board has a bunch of ships in it. And you'll notice a couple of other exciting things here, like the board is parameterized with respect. Oh, and you can't see anything. What? Sorry. OK, now can you see it? Oh, font is too small. OK, yeah. Here we are. OK, so we have a board. And you'll notice that this is parameterized with respect to a label. So, the, so normally when you're writing code, you don't write code that talks about particular principles like Alice and Bob. You write code that's parameterized. And then you can instantiate it. So then the representation of a board contains a list of ships. And you'll notice that list itself is using this parameter L. And so that's the, uh, that's the, in, the label of the information inside the list. So it's, it's basically just a linked list. And then you'll notice also there's a label here, this. So what this means is that the, you can think of the, the information in the reference to the ships list is, uh, has the same label as the board object itself, if that makes sense, right? So, so, it, it, so this works pretty well if you're programming in a, in a largely functional style. So, so, th so there's a distinction here between what information you learn from which list you're talking about. That's what, th that's what this, this label is talking about. Which, you know, you could have many different linked lists floating around, and you're picking one of them, and that's what's, that's what's here. And the, versus the information that's in the list entries themselves, and that's what L is. So we can have a, we can have a, a, a data structure like a list that's kind of heterogeneous with respect to the security levels of the spine of the data structure versus the actual elements of the data structure. 
Okay. And so then, uh, you, so we have an implementation of the jo of the uh, Java collection classes, or some of them at least. So you can create new linked lists. And I'm not sure what else there is that's interesting here. So you can see there's, you know, here we're adding a ship. The ship, uh, so again, using the same label parameter L, uh, the, the ship itself is also a parameterized class. And, uh, we're get, and we're getting a ship S in, and then we add it, and we make sure that it doesn't intersect with any existing ships on the board, and so forth and so on. Okay, so if you, if you download the current GIF uh, release, which is release 3.5, which is not what I'm running, foolishly, uh, this should all work. Um, yeah, and oh, some more exciting stuff. Okay, here's some more, one more fun thing. Uh, so here is something, we're testing whether there's a ship at a particular coordinate. And what you'll notice here is that there's a parameter. Okay, let's see if we can make this fit. Right, so there's a parameter LBL, and its type is label. Well, these labels are exactly the same kinds of things that we've been writing inside of types themselves. Except now it's, a, it's actually a first class runtime value. And so what this, what this uh, test position method is doing is it's saying, uh, th so this is, the P this is the incoming PC label for this method. So you can only call this method if the, if the type checker can prove that the current program counter label is bounded by this, this highlighted label. And the highlighted label, you'll notice, has two components. There's the L that the whole code is parameterized over. And there's this parameter LBL. So, so this kind of horrible star notation means wh what we mean is not, not the label of the variable LBL, but the label in the variable LBL. Okay, so, so you can see that we have some, again, there's some, some kind of dependent typing going on here. And actually, the, the expression that can appear to the right of the star can be, an, can be a, an access path, a final access path. So you can kind of say, if you want to know the label of this thing over here, go look in this data structure over here and follow the following series of pointers. And as long as, and all the pointers along the way have to be final pointers, so it's all immutable. And then, uh, and, and that'll tell you the right answer. Okay. Uh, because in this case, I think it's just the la it's LBL itself is carries some information, like the choice of which label you passed in carries information, and so when you write coordinate of LBL, uh, no, in this case, this this you don't right. It is, it is actually the same as LBL. It's, it's just that when you're writing it inside of brackets, you don't have to write the star because it knows that it's looking at a label. You know, it, there, there are sacrifices must be made when designing language syntax, and this was one of them. Could you write star LBL there? Uh, you could write it if you wrote it inside of braces. So if you wrote this, it would mean the same thing. Okay. So, and then the semicolons are, are basically an information flow join. So you can see that the result of this whole thing is labeled by whatever information was in coord. Ah, something else I didn't tell you. So uh, you'll notice that there's no label on, on, the, on the argument, on this parameter coord, and there's no label on LBL itself. Like LBL is a label, but doesn't have a label declared. And in GIF, that actually implicitly parameterizes the whole thing with respect to the label that was passed in. So then when we say uh, coord over here, what we mean is, coord is not a label. What we mean is, use the label of coord, whatever it happened to be. So, we're, so, so there, when you pass a parameter like coord without an explicit label, there's an implicit parameter named, named coord, which you can use as a label. So that's convenient for expressing things like this. Okay, so this is just to kind of give you a flavor of you know, what happens when you try to build a real programming language that can support uh, the kinds of things you'd like to be able to do. Yeah, question? Semicolon is just an information flow join, mostly. It's a, there's a little bit of magic with the way that it handles integrity and confidentiality policies. But it's basically an information flow join in this context. So we're say, what we're saying here is the result of this method is influenced by some things that are described by LBL itself and the label L of this that we're currently parameterized the whole thing on, and any and the coordinate variable itself. Yep. 
are these labels, are all these labels known at compile time, or could it also be that a label is constructed at runtime? Labels can absolutely be constructed at runtime. So this, so this, this parameter here, that argument is, is going to be a runtime label. And who creates that? How, how the caller ca creates it. Uh, you can create labels of the same kinds that you see in the in 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 here. I can let's see if I can find. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where this gets called. All right, here we are. Okay, so you can see a new label being created right here. So that actually creates an object, and when this so this language works by compiling down to Java, and it. Uh, and, and so that, that actually corresponds to creating a Java object to represent the label. And, but the compiler knows some extra things about it. Like it actually, the compiler knows that this is this particular label. Yeah? So um, last lecture you mentioned capabilities really briefly, and I was wondering how this sort of like runtime instantiation of like principle and labels um, is either similar to or different than the idea of like capabilities? It's similar, and in fact, you can implement capabilities in GIF. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there's, I think there's, there, in the GIF distribution, there's actually a capability class which you can use. So, yep. So, when you pass around principles, principles are not capabilities. They're just like the names of principles. But you can construct a class which embodies the power of a principle and then lets you pass it closures to invoke and it will invoke them as that principle. And then it can do things that only that principle could do, like, for example, release uh, secret information of, from that principle. Actually, that reminds me, I should show you something like that. Oh, uh, yeah, here, it's right on the screen. Okay, so, so here's an interesting thing. Um, and I'll talk more about this next time. But so we're, we're inside a method which is handling, uh, basically, moves that people are making. And it's receiving a query, which is a coordinate that, that one, you know, one, one of the players is testing. Um, now in the, players are, the players are called P and O here, like player and other. And so what's happening here is that the query comes in. It's, uh, it's, what this says is that it's trusted by both P and O. So basically this means we have two people who don't really natively trust each other, necessarily. And at some point, we have to, they have to agree on what move was made at a particular point in the game. So they're going to need to both trust the move. And so, th so there's, a, there's a step where we're going to bump up the integrity to, to represent that. At the same time, there's also a problem that we want to release information that's re previously secret. So we talked about earlier you know, the conference reviewing thing. Well, think about the game of Battleship. Your, the other player's board is secret. But when you make a move, you say, I'm going to drop a bomb on square A3, that, that particular square now becomes not secret. And, and so we want to be able to say, OK, it's, it's OK to release this information. So that's what's happening at the end of this query code. Right here, we declassify the result. So we're taking information that was that the result natively says, this is, this is P's code here. Uh, so we have information that is owned by player P. And uh, it, it, it is uh, secret to player P. And we're changing its label to be a pure integrity policy, which, only, which says now everybody gets to know this thing. But everybody still trusts it. Okay, So, that, so that's, uh, that's a declassify operation. And there's, there's a dual thing called endorse. And somewhere in here, there will be some places. Okay, this is where we endorse the board so that both, both people pl play, trust. Oh yeah, here, here's the, I mentioned that we have, to in, we have to bump up the integrity. Well, that happens here. Here we get in a coordinate uh, which is only trusted by the other player. We're, we're, we, are, you know, we are the player, there's this other person, O. They're giving us a move. And, and we have to say, well, you know, ordinarily you don't trust any information from the other player. But it's part of the rules of the game that when they give you a move, then you say, that's their move. And you can consider it to be a trustworthy thing. And so, so that's what this endorse is doing. We're, we're now adding, we're, we're going from O left arrow, which is the integrity of O, to P and O uh, left arrow. Okay? So 
so the nice thing about this is that you, you can see there are these, these operations endorse and declassify, which are potentially dangerous operations because they let you do things to the labels that violate the, the lattice policy. So I'll talk more about those uh, in a, in, tomorrow and how we can constrain them so they're not so dangerous as they might sound. But the other point is that the, when you look at the code, it has some endorses and some declassifies, but mostly not. Most of the code is not doing these, these dangerous things. So, what the, so, I, so I think that this helps a lot when you're writing the code. It kind of creates a, a potential function to write only safe things and also lets you focus your attention on the, the more dangerous aspects of your code, where, you're, where, you're, where you are doing things in violation of the standard uh, lattice rules. OK, great. So I, I'll, I'll stop demoing now. Who knows what new bug I'll run into if they keep going. Um, let's see here. That was probably the wrong thing to do, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, it turned out that I was supposed to push all on and not off. <laughs> so off was a little bit the wrong thing. OK, so so just to, to summarize all the stuff that I just showed you. We can write code that's parameterized with respect to principles and labels. And we have parameterization. We have very simple dependent types. Actually, in some of our more recent work, like secverilog, we've, we've made the dependent types more expressive. But uh, that's, that's the... Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty cautious about making dependent types more expressive than necessary. Um, and I guess the, the other interesting thing I showed you is that there's downgrading. And um, so, so that lets you do these endorse and declassify operations. And this ultimately uh, compiles and links to Java, so you can actually write things in it. The biggest thing that we've built in GIF is a voting system called Civitas, which was 18,000 lines of code. And uh, sort of, a, I think about 13,000 of it is GIF code, and then the rest is some, uh, some crypto libraries that were more convenient to build in some other language, because crypto doesn't really go very well with information flow in a certain sense. Like it's, not, it's not helpful, because all the magic of cryptography this analysis can't understand. OK. Um, oh, and one other thing I wanted to show you, but I didn't actually show you, is that you, you can do both dynamic and static checking. So in particular, uh, imagine that you have two variables, x and y, with labels L and L2. So you can do the following thing. You can ask, does L flow to L2? And the compiler will recognize that this is a special test on labels. And it actually augments the typing environment with the fact that that flow is allowed. And so then it will allow you to do this assignment. And it's allowed exactly because we know that this condition holds. And notice that, in general, L and L2 might be labels that themselves carry information. So in fact, we have to track, uh, we have to track implicit flows through this test itself to get this right. OK, so that, that turns out to be extremely helpful. And any time you are building an application where you need access control, you end up doing tests like this. So you know, if, you know, suppose that you are building an application where you are implementing a social network and some information is allowed to be sent to your friends. 
Well, in order to send something to the friends, you'll have to be able to prove at compile time that that, that person is your friend. And the way that you do that is by doing tests like this. You test for relationships between labels or between principles, and, uh, and that establishes the necessary trust relationships or information flow relationships that allow this thing to type check. So the point is, you have to use that access control, and then the type system will actually force you to do the right access control checks, which is uh, pretty helpful. Yep. What if I don't do the test? Then the compiler will reject it. Okay. It'll say, I, you know, I, it'll, it'll say, you know, there's a flow from L to L2. I mean, I, I didn't declare the value of L and L2. I just write Y. If you just left this out, or? I, I write, I declare X and Y, and then I say Y if you just said y gets x, yes. yeah, then it'll say it's a, it's a type error. Okay. Because it doesn't know that L and L2 have any relationship but to each other in general. That's right. Okay. So it'll statically require that. Okay. Right. Exactly. That flow will only be, this, this is only allowed if L uh, flows to L2. And, per, and if there's some program counter label ambient here, then it would also have to flow to L2. We could, but we don't have to. Okay. So you're, you're allowed to write else. And in, in this clause, there's no added information. You don't get to assume. It's not helpful to know that one label doesn't flow to another label. Like that, doesn't, that doesn't ever allow you to have more things happen. You can also test, so there, there are also principles in the language, and you can also test relationships between principles, and that's another uh, separate lattice. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about one kind of cool thing that we've done with uh, GIF beyond just building applications in it. And that is an idea that we called secure program partitioning. So the idea here is one of the big reasons why you would like to have security verification is for reasoning about building distributed systems. Distributed systems are very often distributed precisely because there is some distrust in the system, right? You, you put things at at network hosts where there's adequate trust for the things you're trying to do. And so our idea was, you know, it's, it's pretty painful to write distributed systems because the minute some program becomes distributed, you have to use all kinds of special APIs for communicating information. Uh, you know, it's, it's extremely tedious. Often you're mo working in multiple languages, and then you have to figure out how to, how to marshal and unmarshal data from JavaScript to Java or you know whatever, right? Uh, and I don't have, have you, how many of you guys have actually built a distributed program? Okay, a bunch of you. So, so you know what I'm talking about, right? The, 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 it's 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 quite it's quite tedious, um, especially if you have complex data structures. You need to communicate across uh, a distributed system. Okay, so so our idea was, hey, let's uh, let's get rid of all of that. Let's let people write one program that they can that can be automatically partitioned to run on a distributed system. So we have, normally when you write a program in a language like, say, Java, there isn't enough information in the program to figure out what would be a secure way to partition the program across a distributed system. But now we have a language where we're actually saying how much everything has to be trusted and how, how secret everything has to be. So we actually have the information to figure out what's supposed to happen. So, uh, so an example of this is a system we built called Swift. So Swift is a system for web applications. So the idea is that you write your code in the GIF programming language. And your, your code actually includes both the, what you would think of as the uh, server side uh, application logic and what you would normally think of as the client side in a web application, uh, uh, JavaScript kind of uh, code, right? The stuff that manages buttons and, and all of that sort of stuff, right? So, you, 
So you start with that, and you have one application, which looks kind of like an application that runs on a, on a you know, 1990s style graphical user interface toolkit. Uh, right? There's no distribution involved. Right? <clears throat> so then you send that into the compiler. And the compiler has the, the, the same front end as the GIF compiler, which checks all the information flow in the way that I've been describing. But then it has a new back end. So the back end we call the splitter. And it, its job is to take this high level code that looks like it runs on one fictitious machine that everybody trusts and produces a realization of it for a distributed system. So in particular, it will produce code that is supposed to run at your application server. And it produces Java code for that. And then it also, so, so it finds everything that has to run at the server and, put, and puts it there. And it finds the things that can run at the client. And it generates JavaScript for those. And so this, so this is the stuff that you run on the browser. And then these two things have to talk to each other. And so the compiler synthesizes a protocol for these things to talk to each other. <clears throat> so what the, what, the, what the splitter is going to do is make sure that anything that's secret so the, the, the trust model here, by the way, is that the browser is not trusted. So the idea is we have people using uh, tr a trust, trusted application, the server's trusted, and the, the browser is potentially compromised. So we want to prevent people from, from uh, hacking their browser in some way uh, to compromise either confidentiality or integrity. So the, so the server uh, code keeps all the secrets. and. Uh, trusted code, or I should say, trusted data, is all is kept on the server. Now, sometimes there are, it, sometimes it's actually valuable to put some of your trusted data on the client, as well. Now, you might think that that sounds kind of bad. I told you the client was untrusted, so how can you put trusted data on the client? Well, you can put trusted data on the client if you also keep it on the server. And then you double check everything that you did. And so in fact, the, the compiler does this as well. So, so, so if you have trusted computation, and trusted computation here means things with a, with a you know, trusted integrity level in the information flow sense, that will be done on the server. And uh, it will also be replicated on the client if it helps performance. So an example of this is it, uh, form validation. So you guys, you know, you know, you're working with a web, uh, a web application and ask you to do something like type your email address. And there's some code that runs in JavaScript uh, typically, that looks at your, at your uh, email address and decides whether it's a legal email address or not. And then it's, because it's running on your browser, it's able to instantly tell you, no, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a bogus email address. Right? But then, what happens when you submit the form? Well, the server can't trust that the browser implemented that email address check correctly. So there's some more code running on the server that checks that whether it's a valid email address. And hopefully that code does you know, morally the same thing as the JavaScript code. But you don't know that. Right? And, 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 and so you tediously have to implement the same code in two different languages. And then you have to hope that, you actually got, that they actually did the same thing. So instead, what's going to happen here is if you have a, a computation like that, the computation is, is automatically replicated. So you, it, the compiler synthesizes validation code that runs on the client. And uh, and the same code on the server. And so the code will actually, in general, run at both places. 
So you get kind of the best of both worlds. You write, you, you write one piece of code, and it runs at the places that it needs to run, and you get the responsiveness of, the, uh, of running it on the client and the security of running it on the server. OK? Yeah? Yes. Sure. Yes. Uh, well, so the so first of all, it's I, I'm not sure what what kind of attacker you're worried about here, but the 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 information in the that's exchanged in the protocol is all labeled in the way that I've been describing, and so the server knows what parts of the what information that's coming in the protocol is trustworthy from the from the client. So, so, for, so the client, for example, if the client tells the server, please update the following variable to the following value, the server will only allow that to happen if the, uh, if, if the client is trusted to update that variable. So there's, some, so there's some runtime checks being done on the messages coming from the client to make sure that, it, uh, th th that, the, that the client is not uh, corrupting things. And in fact, the, the server pretty much knows, because the, the compiler knows what code it's generating, the server knows what messages it's expecting from the client at any given time. Okay, there are lots and lots of details that I'm eliding here in the, in the interest of time. But uh, you can take a look at uh, our paper. This is actually from SOSP 2007. We also uh, did something similar and in some ways more general earlier. So there's a version of GIF called GIF split, and that's actually an SOSP 2001. So there, there, are, some, the, the, there are some improvements that we made. I mean, one, one thing that we did was we made it really work in a web setting. And Swift does a much better job of generating efficient code, and that uh, stuff that I talked about where we're replicating data and computation is something that only Swift does. Uh, so, um, so anyway, this, 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 this is, I think, part of the motivation here was programming with information flow labels is kind of painful. And until we have something like this, it feels like it's a lot of pain, and then you end up with a program that pretty much looks like the program you had already. Here, there's actually like some payoff. You can actually write simpler code. And, 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 and another cool thing about it is that uh, the, the, when you run the splitter, so in the case of, of Swift, the tr all the trust is fixed. But in general, you can have some kind of description of, the, of what trust you have in your system. And, and actually, GIF split supports this. So you can describe how trusted all of the different hosts are in your distributed system. And the splitter will decide how it does this transformation based on those trust relationships. So that means you can change your trust configuration. You can say, oh, I'm going to add a, a trusted third party to the system, or, or get rid of a trusted third party. And that'll cause the compiler to generate different code. And so your, your code is, you know, normally if you were doing this in a building distributed system and you trust change your underlying trust configuration, you'd be in for a whole lot of work of you know, designing new protocols and, and unmarshalling and marshalling data structures. And it'd be bad, right? Here are the, you know, this is the kind of stuff compilers should do for us. OK. So anyway, that, that's, I, I think, kind of fun. So let's uh, now go back to, to formal land for a bit. Unless there are any other questions. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that like, it's kind of painful to actually do all the like, labels and stuff in the code, um, although you can get like, great benefit out of it. Have you looked into like, any sort of like, inference system or like, thing that like, alleviates? Like, yeah, definitely. So yes, I, I didn't talk about this. But actually, m typically when you write GIF code, you don't write down these labels. The, the labels show up in signatures of functions. But they don't. But but in the bodies of uh, of functions, you don't write them down. So it actually does quite a bit of inference to to fill in the labels. Yeah, and the, and and like all uh, type inference algorithms, this comes. It's a double-edged sword. When inference fails, then you're. It's you know. It's it's it has the same problem that uh, you know Camel and Haskell have, where you get a type inference error and you and it's it points you to the wrong line of code and tells you. Somewhere in lines 200 uh, to 257, there's a, you know, something wrong, right? And it spits out a giant type. Uh, so, uh, 
for the same problem. The, I think this is an intrinsic problem when you try to prove global properties about programs and those properties don't hold, it's hard to localize where the programmer mistake was. So we've actually done some work in the last uh, few years on getting better localization for GIF and, actually, and also Haskell and OCaml that fell out uh, sort of for free. Um, so I, I, think there, I think we can do better than, than the version of GIF that's been released. I, mean, I know we can do better, but um, engineering a real language is a lot of, a lot of work. <clears throat> okay, so what I wanted to do now is go back to the formal side and just show you uh, show you what we are actually getting from the security. So, so what I so what did I do earlier? I said here's a type system. And then I said, well, what kind of security do we hope this type system enforces? And I, and I wrote down a definition of, of that security. Now, what I completely failed to do was show you that that type system actually enforced that kind of security, right? So you, but you all just accepted it somehow, <laughs> okay? You should have been more skeptical. All right, well, actually, I wasn't lying. Uh, so let's, let's look at what it takes, though, to prove non-interference. And so what I'm going to do now is, um, show you how we can prove that a type system enforces non-interference. It's actually, and it's going to be term, termination insensitive non-interference. So I'm going to be uh, cribbing here, and I think hopefully simplifying things a lot, uh, on the the seminal paper that showed that this could be done by uh, Volpano, Smith, and Irvine. I think it's 96? It's 96 or 97. Um, I don't remember the title of the paper offhand, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm setting up a web page which will link to all of these papers that I'm mentioning. Okay, so this is, this is a great paper. Uh, it showed uh, that these, these ideas that people had introduced, that non-interference and the idea of certifying programs for, for secure information flow could actually be combined in, in a natural way. And so, so let's, let's see how that plays out. So recall how we define non-interference. We said that we're going to consider that if we have two indistinguishable states, then we should have indistinguishable behaviors. And we just have to instantiate these symbols for our, uh, for our language that we defined earlier. Okay, so we want to prove that well-type programs are going to satisfy this property. So let's define that the state S is going to be a pair of a command and a mapping from variables to values. And the values are all going to be integers because this is imp. So I'll use a lowercase gamma to represent the mapping from variables to um, integers. <clears throat> okay. And, and now let's, we're thinking about the world from the perspective of some attacker. So we'll let L be an arbitrary lattice point. Which is going to capture what the adversary is able to see directly. And so now we can talk about whether two current uh, stores, gamma, represent, uh, are indistinguishable to the, to the attacker at level L. So we'll say that gamma 1 is indistinguishable from gamma 2 if for all variables x, If x is a low security variable, then the two stores agree on what the value of x is. Right? So the idea is th these are the only things the adversary at level L can see. So, that, so if they're all equal, then they, they, the adversary can't distinguish them. And then to define the notion of indistinguishability on full states, uh, we're just going to look at the final state of the execution. So I'm going to just ignore the, so if we have some C1, gamma 1, 
uh, we will just simply ignore the command part of it. Okay, now if we wanted to talk bigger, okay, sorry, we're getting too small here, I, I hear. All right, I'll try to be bit, try, write larger. Okay, so. So now I'm going to assume that we have a semantics for imp, which is deterministic. And I'm, and I'm going to use a big step semantics because that makes life easier. Everything that I'm doing can be done with small step semantics, but as, as I'll describe later, it, it makes things harder. Big step semantics is a nice property that kind of keeps the structure of the computation in the, in the proof tree more than, the, than small step does, and that, that uh, makes it easier to do certain reasoning. Okay, so we'll have a big step semantics where we can uh, take a state which is a, a command and, a, and a, a store gamma. And, okay, I shouldn't use that. And we get a new store, gamma prime. Okay, and if, for divergent programs, then we just won't get an output. Okay, so, so we'll define our notion of the, of the behavior of a, of, a, of a program, a state S, will be just the final state gamma if where S is equal to C uh, gamma, okay, let's say it's gamma prime, if C gamma evaluates to gamma prime, and we'll just say it's bottom otherwise. So again, this is the bottom representing non-termination. Okay, so then we'll consider that two behaviors, S1 and S2, are low equivalent if either one of them turns out to be bottom. So if either one of them diverges, then we just say, oh, we couldn't tell the difference between, b between them. Or if there exist, say, okay, no, I don't, I don't want to say that. So, so or if, S1, the, meaning, the behavior of, S, of, of, of S1 is uh, gamma 1, and the behavior of S2 is gamma 2, and um, these two things are equivalent to each other. Okay? All right, so now we can write down a termination insensitive non-interference statement says, if we start out in initial stores, gamma 1 and gamma 2, and we have a program that type checks according to our type system, and there exist final states gamma prime and gamma, gamma one prime and gamma two prime such that C gamma one evaluates to gamma one prime and C, C, C sorry, gamma two evaluates to gamma two prime. So if, if either of these doesn't hold, then if either one of these diverges, then this is going to just sort of trivially hold. So the only case we really need to worry about is the case where they both evaluate to some final state. Both programs terminate. Okay? So, so, that, so then <clears throat> what do we want to have hold here? Well, since the initial states were the same or indistinguishable, then we require that the final state
Okay? Do we buy that? So this is what we'd like to prove about our type system. We want to show that low equivalence is preserved by evaluation, assuming we started with a type correct program. Okay, so there are a bunch of fiddly details that I have to, that I'm going to skip over in showing you this, but I want to just give you the gist of the proof. Um, so let's see. Sorry? Everything is free. I like your positive attitude. Okay. Okay, so. So we, we can prove this by induction on the derivation of C sigma C gamma one evaluates to gamma one prime. Yep. Um, I'm just thinking about the existential quantifier. Uh, it seems like gamma one prime and gamma two prime on the right hand side of the arrow are not as good anymore. You are absolutely right, and my my parenthesis went wild. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah, that still doesn't work, does it? Oh. You're right, you're right, there's an issue here. Uh, you're right, we should, just, we should just universally quantify over the whole thing, I guess. All right. Does that, make, does that work? That should work. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's just let's just look at some cases. So, what if C is skip? That better be easy, right? <clears throat> so, in that case, the sigma one prime is just so by the way, sigma uh, gamma one prime is gamma one, and gamma two prime is gamma two, right? Because that's the semantics of skip. It just gives you the same store back again. Um, and so, so trivially, we have that the, the indistinguishability is preserved. OK. Uh, how about the case where C is x gets a? So here things get a little bit more interesting. Uh, so first of all, let's, let's actually consider two cases. One is the case where we're assigning to a low variable and the, and the other is the case where we're assigning to a non-low variable. So let's, let's start with a non-low variable. In other words, this is an assignment to a variable x that the adversary shouldn't be able to see the value of. And what that means is that when we're comparing two states of the system, that, the, that this variable will not be part of that comparison effectively. Right? Okay. So our states, our resulting states, will be the same as the original states, except that the variables will be, uh, the variable x will be updated in some way. There's some value v1 that, that, that a evaluates to. And gamma 2 prime is going to be gamma 2 with x evaluate, updated to some v2, right? But since we didn't actually care, we, we knew that the gamma 1 and gamma 2 already agreed on everything, everything low, and x is not low, then clearly we're, we're going to still agree on all the low things afterward. 
even though we might have computed different values for A in, in the, two, uh, the two possible uh, executions. Okay? All right. How about the case where x, it's x gets A and gamma of x says that x is, in fact, low? Here I need to appeal to some kind of lemma here. So since we know gamma of x is low, from the typing rules I gave you before, we know we're updating a low variable. So that means the program counter is also low. Otherwise, we wouldn't be, this wouldn't have type checked in the first place. And we know that the label of L, we, we know that A has some label L. And we know that L is also low. Right? We must be assigning a low variable into a uh, in, into, into x, right? And uh, so now now we need to appeal to some knowledge about what happens when we evaluate low expressions. We need a we need a lemma that says that if we have a low expression, uh, and we have two possible stores, gamma one and gamma two which are low equivalent, the typing rules are going to make sure that A only uses low variables. So we know that, in fact, all the low variables that are used by, these, by, by, by this expression are actually the same in both of these two, these two uh, uh, stores, right? <coughs> so uh, in that case, we know that uh, A has the same value. in both, of the, both gamma 1 and gamma 2. OK? And so now what that tells us is that gamma 1 prime is just gamma 1 with x updated to some value v. Let's call it v. And gamma 2 prime is, is, must be gamma 2 with x updated to the same value v. And so now, once again, these two are going to agree on all. We, we can see that they, they agree on the low variable x. And we know by, by assumption that gamma 1 and gamma 2 agreed on all the other low variables. So therefore, they must still agree with each other on all low variables. OK? Yeah? It's the same v? It's the same v. Yeah, that was, uh, this is my, my unproved lemma, but hopefully intuitive. OK? It's, it's crucially because A has to be a low expression that we know that there's only one V at play here. Wait, you explain that? A is a, a, is a low expression, right? It's type, it's type L. It's, it's security type L is low. Therefore, it only uses, and we could prove this by induction, but it's, it's only using variables that are low variables. And therefore, all those variables have to agree with each other. Because, because we knew that in gamma 1 and gamma 2, they, they agree on all the low variables. OK? All right. Let's see. So let's try, see if we can do uh, sequential composition. So the big step evaluation rule, if you guys can summon up a, a memory of what that would look like, gives us, gives us some things. Right? If we know that C evaluates to, you know, C evaluates in gamma 1 or gamma 2 to some, uh, some final state, that implies that we must have been able to evaluate C1. And then from wherever that left us off, it evaluates C2 to that final state. Right? So big step evaluation says that we have uh, C1, gamma 1, evaluates to some gamma 1 double prime. And then C2 
gamma 1 double prime evaluates to gamma 1 prime. Right? To the two steps of the evaluation. And then, of course, we're going to have the same, whoops, the same thing happen with gamma 2. So we have a whole bunch of facts that come out from that. Okay? And now we're going to appeal to induction. So these are, these are premises of our, uh, of our evaluation rule. And so we will appeal to induction to conclude that gamma 1 double prime has to be indistinguishable from gamma 2 double prime. And now, given that gamma 2 double prime is, is, given this fact, we can now apply induction to these guys. And again, by induction, conclude that the whole thing goes through for that case. OK? All right. And. Let's do while, and I will, I will leave if as, a, as an exercise for you guys. But it's pretty similar to while. OK. All right, so there are. So the big step rule for evaluating while is that it's actually two rules. There's the case where B evaluates to false and the case where it evaluates to true, right? So let's, let's break those out. So we'll say, what if B evaluates to, uh, to false? So in that case, we know that sigma 1 prime is the same as sigma 2 prime, as si sigma 1. And so now why do we know? OK, I think my case analysis is not good enough here, actually. Um, all right, let's just, let's just say that, that B is actually low. So if this evaluates to false, then uh, the lemma that I mentioned earlier, or the kind of counter uh, matching one for Booleans, uh, then B will evaluate to false in sigma 2 also. And so we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll have the, the, the states will be the same as the initial states, so it's the same as skip, right? So, that, so that's, that's basically trivial. Okay. And in the case where B evaluates to true, then... The rule looks like this. Uh, we have, let me just write out the evaluation rule. So we have while, while B do C uh, and sigma evaluates to sigma prime if, sorry, wait, wait, gamma, sorry, not sigma. Normally when I, teach this, uh, when I teach the graduate programming languages course at Cornell, I use sigma for this and I'm paying the price now. I, I don't know why I changed the gamma, but... <laughs> uh -uh. Okay, so this evaluates to true. And uh, the command C in gamma evaluates to some sigma double prime. And then in addition, 
and then the rest of the iteration takes place. So we so while B do C, sorry, we should call this. Eh, I should name this C something else. Let's see, uh, C prime. Okay. So then while B do C prime in sigma double prime has to evaluate to double prime has to evaluate to gamma prime. Thank you. Okay, correct modulo primes. Yes? Sorry, in the false case, yep. why is gamma prime 2 equal to gamma 1? Um, it isn't. Okay. It should be two, gamma 2. Yeah, sorry about that. Right, so, and since these guys are, yeah, you, you, you got it. Okay, so, uh, great. So now uh, we can conclude By induction, we can now again, we can do, use the same argument that we use with sequential composition because we basically have a sequential composition here, right? We're, we're just composing this with this. So by induction, we have uh, the, the, the gamma one double prime is going to be indistinguishable from gamma two double prime. And then we can conclude also by induction since we were doing induction on these, on these evaluation rules, we, we can assume that it holds of this premise as well, uh, that, uh, that, the, that gamma 1 prime is indistinguishable from gamma 2 prime. Okay? Yep. Why, what is? Right here. Uh, because I left out a prime there. Is that better? Yeah, so C is, C is this whole while B do C prime thing, yeah. Okay, any other primes or one, two shifts that need to be made here? Okay. Great. So let's see, I have about uh, 10 minutes left. So I, I will leave the, the rest of the proof for you guys to, to think about. There are a couple more cases to fill out, but you get, you get the flavor. What other cases would you recommend other than if for us to think about? Well, I actually didn't finish while, because oh. there's a case where the Boolean is, uh, is not low. Right? And in that case, we know that the command is not low either. And, and so it's not. Uh, Because the program counter goes high because of the Boolean. Okay. So. So I assumed various things here, um, and also you need, there's, there's also the issue of um, showing that the typing that you need to have a, a preservation argument as well. Which, you can, which is another thing to think about, because our, our, induction, uh, our induction hypothesis required that the program, the command be well typed. So if you, if you look at Volpano, Smith, and Irvine, you'll see that their proof is quite a bit longer than what I presented, because I brushed a whole bunch of things under the rug. OK, so I wanted to say a little bit about determinism. So we also assumed that the language was deterministic. And uh, in general, that's not a feature that we have. And so there's a question about non-determinism. What happens when we want to think about the security of non-deterministic systems? As I mentioned at the beginning, we care a lot about non-determinism because our specs are non-deterministic. <clears throat> so and in particular, what happens when we think about concurrent systems? Right? They're, they're naturally non-deterministic. <clears throat> so probably we need to give up on this big step semantics, for starters. Right? Big step semantics doesn't work well with, with non-determinism. So we want to explore a, a small step semantics. where. 
so where it looks uh, something like this. We have, we have some C and gamma, and then it's going to step to a new configuration, new state, C prime, gamma prime. Right? And this, this is intrinsically harder than working with big step semantics because the, we're, we're, it, wasn't, it wasn't probably very apparent in what I was doing there, but we, we were able to leverage the fact that the big step semantics kind of keeps the structure of the program together in, this, in the proof tree, whereas the small step semantics completely destroys it. Right? You don't really know, like for example, when a while command ends in the small step version because it, it uh, just keeps chugging along. Um, and, and if, and, well, I guess if is maybe even a, a worse case than, uh, than while. So, uh, and, and so what that means is that it's hard to deal with the situation where the program counter goes back down. You don't know when the program counter, you know when the program counter goes up, but you don't really know when it goes back down in the small step view of things. And so there are two ways to deal with, deal with that, or well, at least two ways. Um, so, so one thing that we end up having to do is, first of all, uh, make sure that we are tra So it, what's going to happen is, if we're thinking about these two executions chugging along, the commands themselves will start changing. We won't be looking at the same command. So, so, so for example, imagine that you have an if on some high variable, and then you do, so imagine that your command is something like, if some high, then some C1, else some C2. Well, now we need to think about two small step evaluations, one of which goes into C1, and another one that goes into C2. And so they're now, those, two, those evaluations that we're trying to compare are actually running completely different commands, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's a, a challenge. Um, and so what we'll need to do is use the C component to compare these, these, uh, these uh, states. So we need to have, we need, we need to be talking about uh, two, two states, C1 gamma 1 and C2 gamma 2. And we need to be able to look, we need to actually look into these two guys and see what's going on. So these commands, which so far don't have any labels in them, we need to instrument them with, with something else that tells us which parts of these commands are supposed to be the same because they were, they were sort of low, low contexts, low program counter context, and which parts are allowed to be different. And then when we go into a, a, a branch like this, this if high, then C1 else C2, then we're going to say, oh, these things, can, these things are both high commands. They get to be whatever they want to be. They don't have to be the same in order to consider them the, uh, indistinguishable to the low observer. Okay, so, so what that means is we don't even get to have our original small step semantics. We're going to have to add something. We're going to have to add something to our small step semantics that's tracking these labels. And then we're going to have, to, then uh, we can either hand wave about it or we can prove some kind of adequacy result that says, yes, our new small step semantics agrees with, you know, agrees with the original uh, small step semantics. Okay, so it's, it's much more painful. And then uh, the actual proof then uh, comes down on small steps. And it's going to look like a kind of bifurcation, which I believe you've heard before. So there are two kinds of cases. So th there's, there are what we could call low step cases. So a low step case is where we have two, two states, uh, C1 gamma 1 and C2 gamma 2. And these guys are supposed to be equivalent, or indistinguishable from each other. And they both take a step. And this step is in some sense a step that's allowed to be viewed by the uh, low observer. And so that'll produce some C1 prime, gamma 1 prime, C2 prime, gamma 2 prime. And these will also be indistinguishable to the low observer. 
Okay, so then if, we, if you do a whole bunch of steps like that, you can see that at every point we're preserving, throughout execution, we're preserving that indistinguishability, right? And then we also, and this is where it is not just a simple bisimulation, we uh, need to also consider high steps. So a high step is when you're executing steps in a <coughs> program context that has a high PC. So like this case, if C1 and C2 are going to go marching along, and they're not, uh, they're not going to be related to each other at all. So, so what, keeps, what allows us to say that we're preserving this indistinguishability? Well, it's the fact that none of the updates that these guys can do should be allowed to affect the, uh, the low observable state. So in fact, it's like everything that one of these guys does is, like, is, is kind of a no-op from the standpoint of indistinguishability. So the high step uh, uh, looks like this. We have C1 sigma 1 equivalent to C2, uh, sorry, gamma 1 and equivalent to C2 gamma 2. And we'll be able to take steps on either one of these. And we don't have to relate them because in general these C1 and C2 could be just completely different things. But the, the steps that we take don't actually change anything that is low observable. Okay, so now if you just glue together a whole bunch of steps that look like this and steps that look like this, you can see that at every point we're just preserving indistinguishability and so we get non-interference. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, the summary here is if you want to go beyond what big step semantics are comfortable describing and, and, and you know, it's pretty easy to do that. Uh, the, the, then it's more work. And it's more work because you need to instrument the semantics and you need to define what it means for commands to be uh, indistinguishable from each other. And, uh, and, and that's uh, pretty painful. The, uh, there, there is one, uh, there's a really nice technique by uh, Poitier and Simonet that they invented for the work on FlowCamel. And uh, what they do is they construct, a, um, they construct another instrumented semantics uh, in which you can run both programs at once. So they call these things brackets. So the idea is you have a command which has a bunch of stuff in it. And every place where there's some difference between the two executions that you're trying to reason about, you stick it in this special bracket which has the version for, for execution number one and the version for execution. And then, so then you can show that this semantics actually faithfully emulates the execution of two. So you still have to prove an adequacy result. You still have to have a new semantics. It's not the same as the original small step semantics. But the nice thing about it is that you, you, uh, once you have this semantics, then once you show that, that this thing is soundly typed, it actually implies non-interference. So in some sense, what this is doing is it's adding in that extra structure that I said, that I lamented the loss of when we were talking about small step semantics, right? This is getting back the structure that big step semantics had to play with. And, uh, and, and, and then once we have that, the proof is relatively easy. So this is probably, this is, this is uh, you know, assuming you can capture the semantics of your language this way, then, uh, and then if you can't do big step semantics, this is probably the easiest way to go. It's a very clever technique. Yeah, question? Yeah, I have two questions. The first is, um, how does this, this workaround basically help us know when the program counter goes back down? Well, basically the brackets are surrounding all the parts with high program counters. Okay. That's, that's, that's the way that I would think about it. Yep. What would that, look like? that would be. Imagine that every every value in uh, you know every term is labeled. Essentially, so you could say uh, you could you could say there's skip, but we'll we'll now have skip H and we'll have skip L. Okay. Now maybe skip we don't really need to label, but. So in the case of if, would the label be on the entire if be then 
there'd be a label on the if, and then, that, and then when we go into the if, we would propagate that label into the, the two cases. So each of the cases, each of the subcommands of the if, the consequent and the alternative, would acquire that label. Once they finished, then, then the label would be erased, and we would be able to kind of pop back to whatever the original program counter label was. But we have to prove a bunch of results that, you know, that we're getting those labels right. Yeah. Okay. yeah they're the sort of forgetting the high label. You know, if, you, if you go into a high context, then, then you're, you're, once that context finishes, uh, that, that, that label will go away. You know, maybe it'll be preserved in the sense that any updates that were made by that context to the, to the store are, are going to be remembered, and they'll only be to high variables. OK. Yep. Well, so, so the idea is that basically you show that, that in fact, all three of these things are squiggle L to each other. Yes. That, right? So, so this, th this, see, this is actually, yeah. So basically you're going to show that, that these things are, are equivalent, and therefore, by transitivity, uh, the new states are as well. Well, we can then let we can let C two take a step, and it and it's also high, oh. and so we'll get another diagram that looks you know another triangle. Okay. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah, I I, I consider walking through all of this, uh, but I think it's it, I think it's better to hit it at this level of abstraction than hit every minute detail. Okay, I think that's all I have time for now. You guys can take a break. Thanks.